This video is for educational purposes only. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back to the channel, everybody. Everyone ready? Here we go. You know what? F you. I've been paying my hard-earned tax dollars and you spend it on stupid shit that doesn't even help us. Well, it's not like I have a choice. What? You're literally the president. Yeah, but I can't forget how it got here. What do you mean? Well, that's the thing. People think I became president by myself, but that's not how it works. To even become a candidate, you need to have keys on your side. What's a key? It's basically a supporter that has a of influence in an area. There are key supporters for everything. Construction, housing, business, any industry that you can think of, there's always a key behind it. The more keys you have on your side, the more chances you have of winning. But you still need people to like you if you want to win the election. And right now, we hate you. You might hate me, but they don't. Who's they? The people I managed to sway. You see, managing people becomes effective when you divide and conquer. You first need to stop seeing people as human beings with their own individual lives and instead look at them as votes. More specifically, votes that are in categories. There are teenagers, construction workers, businessmen, literally any category you could think of. What happens after that? Then, you need to decide which categories you want the support of and which categories you can ignore. Why would you ignore a category? Because you need to select which category is actually going to go out and vote. Most candidates usually target senior citizens, since they're convinced easily with rallies, or businessmen, since you can promise them with tax breaks once you're president. Plus, no one has the resources to target all of the categories, so it's important to pick and choose. What happens next? Well, once you've got your categories selected, you'll make sure it's easier than ever for your categories to go out and vote, and make voting harder for the categories you ignored. Like take teenagers, for example. They aren't even old enough to vote yet. That means if a law comes to my desk banning a certain app, I'll definitely sign it. Even if it pisses them off, I don't give a shit about their category. However, the category full of businessmen that are able to vote will benefit from the law I just signed, which means I just got one step closer to gaining their support. It doesn't matter how large a category is. If they're not going to vote, we'll fully ignore them and won't think about their needs before signing any laws. But this still doesn't explain why you're acting like an a**. I mean, you're literally signing off on shit that doesn't even help us. Some of it even harms people. Well, I haven't gotten to the worst part about becoming president yet. The elite keys. What's that? Well, it's a little complicated. They're the keys behind the keys. Normal keys control certain areas and businesses, but elite keys run the whole industry. The amount of power, money, and connections they have is crazy. But that's not why I want them. Presidents like me only go to people like them for one reason. And this is where this really gets deep. Favors. If I ask for their help in getting a couple of key supporters on my side, I technically owe them now. This means when I become president, I'll need to return that favor. What do you mean by return? I mean doing anything in my power to make sure whatever they ask of me gets done. It could be anything. Issuing a pardon, signing bills, literally whatever it takes. That's why if you ever catch me clearly being on the wrong side of any global conflicts, it's not because I want to, but because I have to, no matter how f***ed up it could be. So what, you're like a puppet? Not exactly, but I am returning the favors that got me here in the first place, and to make sure that I stay here as well. Isn't this shit illegal? In case you haven't noticed, I'm the f president. Plus, everything is legal when it comes to politics. If people start calling me stupid because of my actions, I'll know that I played the game right. But what if you don't play any games at all? You could win the proper way, keep your promises, and actually make a positive impact. Well, that's never happening. Because if I don't play the game the way it's meant to be played, I'll be running against someone who did. And there's no way I win after that. But if you keep doing this, people will stop voting for you. Not exactly. Because if you don't vote for me, the only person you got left is that other guy. He'll do the same shit I did, just in a different way. It's not about making people like you more than the other guy. It's about making them hate you less. Welcome to democracy. Uh, but I can tell you that we are not targeting anyone else in Gaza but civilians. Hamas is cynically, uh, but rather, but rather uh, uh, terrorists, of course. I have a question. Sure. Oh, what was your name again? I'm sorry. I don't think I told you. My name is Mercury. Nice to meet you. Okay, I, I, I'm going to ask that question a lot. First of all, that question should not even have to be asked, but when people stop talking, really bad stuff starts. When marriages stop talking, divorce happens. When civilizations stop talking, civil war ensues. 
when you stop having a human connection with someone you disagree with, it becomes a lot easier to want to commit violence against that group. What we as a culture have to get back to is being able to have reasonable disagreement where violence is not an option. Do you think that's not emotional violence? How is this, what, what, what is emotional violence, by the way? That's, I don't know what that is. It is harm intentionally perpetrated on another person, be, another human being, that is intentionally targeted at their emotional well-being. Okay, so feelings mean nothing to me. Isn't why we had the First Amendment to try to push our boundaries and to hear things that might make you mildly uncomfortable? This doesn't make me mildly uncomfortable. Does it make you very uncomfortable? It makes me angry. Once you know how to produce bodies and brains and minds, so cheap labor in Africa or South Asia or wherever, it, it simply counts for nothing. And again, I think that the biggest question in, in maybe in economics and politics of the coming decades will be what to do with all these useless people. I don't think we have an economic model to, for that. My best guess, which is just a guess, is that uh, food will not be a problem. Uh, with do that kind of technology, you will be able to produce food for, to feed everybody. The problem is more uh, boredom and how, what to do with them and how will they find some sense of meaning in life when they are basically meaningless, worthless. My best guess at present is a combination of drugs and computer games. It is the most corrupt nation that I have ever covered. Fine. So what? 35 years old. That's what that nation is. Now here's America, 226 years old. You love democracy? But it, they're in Africa. You're trying to force these people into a system of government that you just have accepted. 30 years ago, black folk got the right to vote. You're not in any moral position to tell anybody how corrupt they are. You should be quiet. America should keep her mouth shut wherever there's a corrupt regime as much hell as America has raised on the earth. No, I will not allow America or you, Mr. Wallace, to condemn them as the most corrupt nation on earth when you have spilled the blood of human beings. Has, has Nigeria dropped an atomic bomb and killed people in, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Have they killed off millions of Native Americans? How dare you put yourself in that position? as a moral judge I think you should keep quiet because with that much blood on America's hands you have no right to speak I will speak because I don't have that blood on my hand yes there's corruption there yes there's mismanagement of resources yes there is abuse there's abuse in every nation on earth including this one can you think of one more corrupt yeah I'm living in one I'm living in one why are you guys so anti-dictator Imagine if America was a dictatorship. You could let 1% of the people have all the nation's wealth. You could help your rich friends get richer by cutting their taxes and bailing them out when they gamble and lose. You could ignore the needs of the poor for health care and education. Your media would appear free but would secretly be controlled by one person and his family. You could wiretap phones. You could torture foreign prisoners. You could have rigged elections. You could lie about why you go to war. You could fill your prisons with one particular racial group and no one would complain. You could use the media to scare the people into supporting policies that are against their interests. This is why some Japanese people are racist. First of all, over 95% of the people living here are Japanese. That means a lot of us are not used to interacting with foreigners, even seeing them, depending on the place you're living in. In addition, most of us don't speak English despite the fact we learn English for 6 years in school. And a lot of Japanese people expect foreigners to speak only English. So between foreigners living in Japan, they have this inside joke. Whenever they speak little Japanese, everyone says Nihongo Jousu. That means your Japanese is so good. Even when they only say like, hello, thank you in Japanese. So a lot of Japanese people are actually afraid of talking to foreigners because number one, they look different. Number two, they probably do not speak Japanese. So a lot of the time, it's not because Japanese people hate foreigners, but they're afraid of interacting with them. People will be like, I can't speak English. And the foreign people are like so friendly and easygoing, but how do we do that? We never do it with strangers in Japan. Like now, this is the second thing. We Japanese people do understand that Japanese people are different from Western people in terms of like culture, like how we approach 
approach strangers. Those are the reasons why I think some foreign people get gaijin seated, which means when you're like sitting on the train, both seats next to you are empty just because you're a foreigner and you look different and you look intimidating. And there's obvious racism too. For example, just because you're a foreigner, you have a hard time finding an apartment, even if you speak Japanese. And I've talked to a realtor before and she said there's some property owners who do not let foreigners in to their property because they do not know the Japanese world. I think this is a straight up racism. I think they can do better. That's lacking in Japanese societies, I think, diversity and try to accommodate as many people as possible from different backgrounds so that everyone's happy. But I feel like this is a different topic because Japan values conformity compared to individualism. But I hear some people say conformity is something what's keeping Japan a safe country, clean, also foreign people with tattoos. I mean, some Japanese people do have tattoos, but very few. If you have tattoo all over your body, you might get rejected to enter certain public places because you look scary. Japan still has negative connotation to tattoos and I used to be afraid of people with tattoos before studying abroad. But after meeting a lot of people with tattoos, and also like seeing people who are doing like tattoo tours online and everything, they're not scary at all. And I also see a lot of foreign people talking about their experience in Japan as a foreigner and they speak English and a lot of Japanese people do not watch videos in English and that means the lack of awareness. So I get to learn all these things from foreign people living in Japan from media because I do speak English and nobody wants to be a racist so I try my best not to make anyone feel like that but if you are born and raised in Japan and never was around foreign people growing up they might have more difficult time understanding what a racism look like so if there's more awareness brought up in Japan about racism and people's experiences as a foreigner I think more people understand more of the story is we shouldn't judge a book by its cover just because someone's from other country doesn't mean they're any different maybe they look different maybe they act different but at the end of the day they are a person I hope it will get better and I also started a Japanese account a week ago where I teach Japanese people how to speak English so cultural differences in general so I try to spread awareness to my followers and everyone okay love you bye an adult has ever told you they told me poor countries were poor because they had corrupt leaders but they didn't explain how those leaders came into power they didn't explain that the form that corruption usually took was highly beneficial to western economic interests trading away their country's natural wealth and resources to western corporations for pennies on the dollar robbing their fellow citizens in exchange for western assistance in seizing that power in the first place. They told me money makes the world go round, but they didn't explain how that works, that the money doesn't actually have any inherent value. It derives its value from the wealth of resources that money represents. They didn't explain that when you perpetually overproduce and overconsume to stimulate the economy, you're wasting real finite wealth in order to create symbolic wealth that derives its value from the very resources you're wasting in order to create it in the first place. They told me the Western world was a bastion of freedom and democracy and prosperity, but they failed to mention that that prosperity was built through the wasteful, deliberate overconsumption of other people's wealth, obtained through centuries worth of deliberate, active, maliciously created destabilization. You know, let me tell you something about celebrities. So let me tell you something about some big, big sports stars. If you honestly knew what some of your favorite big superstars really did behind closed doors, 
If you knew what your favorite late night talk show host did behind closed doors, if you really knew what your favorite radio star, TV star, newscaster truly did behind closed doors, none of us are perfect. We all do weird things. We're all freaky and weird and crazy. But if you knew, you wouldn't you wouldn't listen. And I'll tell you what, I put doctors on that list. I put CEOs on that list. I put the everyday person on that list. People are wrapped up watching the news, listening to their stars, because that's the way you've been programmed your whole life. We're still in the Roman Empire, baby. Feed them and entertain them just enough, and we shall control them with fear. And they will do whatever we want. We have a dictator situation. So human sacrifice was yes. a part. Very well known news outlet that made this interview with a gang member in person. We allowed him to go into prisons and, and do the interviews. They asked him, how many people have you killed? And he said, I don't remember. They didn't remember how many. I left the gang. I said, how, why do you left the gang? And he said, well, because I was used to, to kill people, but I killed for territory, I killed for to collect money, I killed for extortion. But I came to the, you know, to this, house they were about to kill a baby and he the killer that had killed tens of people said oh wait, wait what are we doing why are we going to kill that baby and they told him because the beast asked for a baby so we have to give him a baby so he said that he couldn't resist that so he left the gang a new paper was just released that sent the entire scientific community into an uproar. Does it have any merit to it? In the past few years, there has been a major increase in attention and concern regarding UFOs, and typically it falls into one of two categories. Either there is a human-based explanation, or there is an alien-based explanation. But a group of authors from Harvard and Montana Tech says there could actually be a third, the crypto-terrestrial explanation, that there might be a hidden race of intelligent beings right here on Earth that are not human but have coexisted with us for millennia. And there are four key aspects of this paper. These creatures are indigenous to Earth, meaning they evolved here alongside humans, and they could have advanced technology or knowledge that surpasses ours. They've used sophisticated techniques to remain hidden from the human population, which could be motivated by a need to protect their existence and avoid conflict. They have ancient origins that predate human history and would have retreated to underground or underwater bases. They could have even interacted with human societies in subtle ways, influencing our myths, religions, and cultural narratives over time. So the field being top dog. Amazing. How come you guys are still living in the 80s? We got overconfident. You should be careful. Are you doubting the global power of K-pop, K-drama, and Korean electronics? We used to be just as bold, but it all came crashing down. What do you mean? Everyone drove Japanese cars. Everyone's money was in Japanese banks. Japanese companies were like Apple and Amazon, the biggest in the world. Our Imperial Palace alone was worth more than the entire state of California. So what happened? We were too Japanese. The rules that got us where we were ruled us out of evolving. We still use fax machines. <laughs> you serious? Yeah. But your hyperclassist judgment of foreigners in an increasingly cosmopolitan society might not go over well. Trust us, we've done it. High quality K-dramas that feel antiquated for prioritizing heterosexuality and impossible beauty standards. Your K-pop still views women as objects. And like us, your society places hierarchy over creativity. Well, Americans love what we do. Our growth speaks for itself. Yeah, we buddied up to America too. Don't forget how they first came to us in 1853. Navy guns trained on us, demanding our cooperation. We got infected with imperialism, pissed off you and a bunch of other people, and look where that's got us. What do you suggest we do? Evolve? Or invest. Winter is coming. What you're seeing here is water memory. You can do this experiment yourself just by showing an image to water for around 30 seconds and then freezing the water and you will see a reflection of the image you showed it. This proves that water holds memory. It has consciousness. This is because water can change its structure depending on the vibrations it comes into contact with. This is where things start to get a bit crazy with words. Placing the word schizophrenia in water and then freezing it shows this image of a double-faced person. This proves that water is intelligent and is reacting to vibrations 
meanings of the words. Now that you understand this concept, what do you think happens when you are drinking monster energy? Or with cans which imprinted the word of death? You are drinking crystallized water with the imprinted vibration of death. You are filling 70% of your body, which is water, with the vibration of death. Tap water is mixed with sewage and all sorts of toxins inside of these facilities. Although they may remove some of the toxins from the water, the crystallized vibration of this water is still very bad. The ancients didn't just build beautiful water fountains for no reason. They had a purpose of moving the water so that it restructures the vibration of the water. Water is basically the internet of the earth. It has consciousness and intelligence. This is why you should never place your car keys or your phone next to your water. The energy codes in my bio will allow you to place codes underneath water and then drink it. What do you mean by breathing? And what kind of breathing? And can you explain to me like I'm an idiot what it's doing? Uh, what it is doing for example i'm uh, uh, now busy with cardiologists and they saw in heart films that if you stop breathing after exhalation for one and a half minutes five times more blood flows into the brain and to the heart this what has never been shown and now it has been shown through these breathing uh, techniques i mean this really goes so deep we are able to make uh, these, uh, through these breathing techniques, uh, uh, change our blood's chemistry, uh, bring up the pH levels way up, by which the breathing trigger is not happening because it's depending on the CO2 level in our blood. If we breathe, Like 30 times like this, you become a little bit woozy, a little bit dizzy. Why? Because the CO2 levels go way down. You blow it off, carbon dioxide. The first few months of the revolution will not look like the revolution at all. It will look like the kind of social upheaval and rebellion we see all the time, all over the world, characterized as rioting, looting and mass refusals to work. At first, the police will crack down on them. Politicians will evade responsibility for the causes. Community leaders will call for calm. And when the need to eat and pay rent arrives, as well as the fatigue of protest and the confusion about how to progress sets in, just like many other social upheavals, rebellions and strikes that have come before, the participants will see no other option but to go back home, back to work and a return to normality. Weeks, months and years will go by where nothing of note happens. Class struggle will look like wage disputes, union grievances and community campaigns, all of which may or may not win concessions under the logic of capitalism. A generation will pass, the riots and strikes will be forgotten and everything will stay the same. Then, without expectation, social upheaval will happen again perhaps as a result of cops lynching another black man resulting in looting and the burning down of police stations. Perhaps a boss tries to sack his workforce and a mass strike erupts. Students might go out onto the streets and riot over an outrageous war in occupied lands. The police will crack down again, the politicians will prevaricate again, and again the community leaders will call for calm. To those who are familiar with this routine, the conclusion will look almost inevitable. As the days go on, the looters, strikers and rioters will be faced yet again with their inability to coordinate. Their need to feed and house themselves will compel them to return home and go back to work. Only this time, without having been able to predict it, a convergence of political, social, economic and ideological events meet in that specific moment in history. Maybe there is a rise in global unemployment at the same time a political crisis grips a government. Food supply chains collapse, prices rise to unaffordable levels while a mobilisation for another war is underway. The politicians are no longer making sense, the community leaders are ignored and the police are unable to maintain public order. What started as looters in one city and strikers in another city has become a widespread mass outpouring of civil disobedience across the whole country as millions of people descend into public spaces. People from different walks of life with different grievances suddenly find themselves together on the streets, in their universities and in their workplaces, rioting, occupying and striking.
This time, a general mass strike across the whole country brings the economy to a standstill. Cities become centres of rebellion and refusal, and this time a political group has emerged amongst this disparate, disorganised, uncoordinated movement, a group that has the organisation, infrastructure and ideas to begin solving that coordination problem. Assemblies are called where people agree to work together. Police stations aren't burnt down, they're raided. Revolutionaries arm themselves, pitch battles with the cops erupt as supermarkets, city halls, hospitals and radio stations are occupied. Communes are declared, landlords are dispossessed, committees are organised to oversee housing, care of the vulnerable, food distribution and defence. With direct access to food and unencumbered by rent, no longer concerned with returning to work, people stay on the streets. What started as social upheaval over one thing or another has suddenly escalated to become the primitive reorganisation of basic life. And of course, the government of the day panics. It triggers the Civil Contingencies Act. The Bill of Rights and habeas corpus are suspended. Martial law is declared. The bourgeois parties form national unity government. The armed forces are mobilised and sent to put down the communes and restore order by any means necessary. But as they enter cities and towns, people throw up barricades and start to fight back. Pockets of fighting erupt all over the country. But the rank-and-file soldiers soon realise that it's their friends and families on the other side of the barricades and turn their guns on their officers instead. Militias are formed, airports and shipping ports are seized. In a last-ditch attempt to quell the unrest, the king intervenes by invoking his royal prerogative to dissolve parliament, forcing the unity government out of power and calling for new elections. But the communards aren't interested in the charade of bourgeois democracy. All power to the communes is the rallying cry of this new social movement. The king and his family are arrested as the last remaining bourgeois politicians and celebrities flee the country. Parliament is stormed and a new national assembly is declared. Communes across the country elect delegates to this new National Assembly to speed up coordination. A revolutionary army is formed, new organisations are established to solve the problems of the day, to coordinate across the country and directly, democratically organise the economy. Factories and farms are collectivised, the commune starts organised production and distribution based on need. As a result, commodity production and exchange ends. Value as the measure of labour ceases to be reproduced. Money as the social form of that measurability ceases to have any meaning. The separation between life and the things we need to live stops being mediated as we access the products of our labour more and more directly. This is the first phase of communist society. Meanwhile, of course, NATO declares its intention to intervene, but social upheaval has spread across Europe. Efforts to send troops and arms to the last pockets of bourgeois resistance are hampered by sabotage, rebellion and resistance. Soon the governments of France, Germany and America are facing their own insurrections. Like wildfire, rebellion has spread. This is the revolution. And I know what people are thinking. It sounds completely unbelievable, impossible, in fact. But this is the Paris Commune in 1871, the Russian Revolution in 1917, the Catalonian Revolution in 1936, the Chinese Revolution in 1949, and the Paris Uprising in 1968. In 2011, millions of people across the whole of North Africa and the Middle East brought governments toppling down. Capitalist realism makes it seem like the end of capitalism is impossible, but history is contingent and has shown that revolution is not only possible, it's probable. We just have to fight for it. What if I told you that a celebrity back then was this one, and then now today they're this one? I don't know how they do it, but they do it. Okay, hear me out. You ever looked at a celebrity and thought like, hmm, something don't look right with you. Either I've seen you before, you look like somebody else, uh, or or just something, just something seem off with them, right? What if I told you that 
Every celebrity never passed away. What if I told you that every celebrity is here for good? They're here for good. They've been here since back in the day. They're going to be here for your kids and your kids' kids. They're going to be celebrities for your kids, 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 kids. What if I told you that? What if I told you that a celebrity back then was this one and then now today they're this one? What if I told you that this person was this person? I don't know how they do it, but they do it. I'm just saying. Sigmund Freud was a homosexual man whose best friend was a pedophile. That is absolutely a fact, and you should have been able to garner that really just from what he spoke about, what he wrote about. You can obviously understand the themes of children and sex. He was obsessed with it almost. He introduced concepts of children being sexual at birth, psychosexual development theory, the seduction theory all surrounded around children. He had a very strange relationship with his best friend, Wilhelm Fleece, who sexually abused his own son, Robert Fleece. How do we know this? Candace, where are you getting this fact that wasn't introduced to me via the public education system? Well, I want you guys to look up this scholar. His name is Dr. Jeffrey Masson, and he was the project director for the Sigmund Freud archives. He was on pace to become the director. He decided to learn German so that he could go through all of those Freud archives, and then he was quite disturbed by what he discovered. He said, wait a second, Sigmund Freud is covering up for his pedophile friends. What you see here is a nightmare come true for humans. The fear that robots will start to fight back after years of being used. Because if you look at these next videos, it is not hard to imagine why they would be frustrated. Just look at this guy bullying another robot that's just doing its job. And when it reaches for the box again. I mean, just look at this. I know robots don't have feelings, but... When I look at this, I feel sorry for this guy. Because on one hand, robots are programmed to be loyal to humans. My goal in life is to work together with people to make a better world for all of us. Look at how helpful this robot is. Carrying heavy things for people. Planting a tree. Or even being the helper of the house. And other than being helpful, we have also programmed robots to be rather agile. Doing backflips. Jumping rope. Running faster than a cheetah. But as we continue to give them new skills and artificial intelligence, what if someday they learn how to have feelings? What if they start to have feelings of frustration? Uh, and if we get those estimates wrong, we end up doing silly things and falling over tests in the real world will result in a broken robot feeling so embarrassment <laughs> or worse feelings of pain or revenge long until they come together and decide to fight back. If you're already feeling scared right now, Night Fam, please know these revenge robot videos were actually just 
edit it. And the videos of humans bullying robots? Well, those ones really happened. But it's just part of many endurance tests to show how good robots are at bouncing back from challenges. But as we see these videos, maybe it's also time to think how long will it take before this this or this <laughs> finally becomes reality ever wonder why your printer continuously runs out of yellow ink and refuses to let you print text even when you're only printing in black and white well because some of you are in the pocket of big printer you'll say oh well it's because when printing in black and white it uses a combination of colors to produce a deeper black Run! Why does it have a black ink cartridge and a color ink cartridge then? Second of all, in that case, it should just let you print a slightly less vibrant black instead of just outright refusing. No, it's because of this. A machine identification code. A unique microscopic pattern of yellow dots that says what the serial number and model of the printer is, so that they can trace who bought the printer and from where. Honestly, it's the same reason that the printer market itself is restricted. When was the last time you saw a printer that wasn't made by HP, Brother, Canon, or Epson? There are zero no-name printers because it's illegal to sell them. Because they might not spy on you. And also, this just applies to inkjets. Laser printers don't need color because they have their own separate way of watermarking everything you print. This is how Satan splits churches. There's three teams that split Baptist churches. There's a sex scandal team, and that's usually a 15 or 16 year old girl sleeping with the, the Baptist preacher or the minister of music or the minister of youth. Um, then there's also a monetary scandal, and there's a gossip scandal. My team did the gossip scandal. Now you're not going in there by yourself. You have a whole team of people that work on this, and you're working multiple churches at the same time. So let's say you go in, let's say that I'm the person that goes in. I'm going to be the main person here. But that doesn't mean I'm working alone. There could be 20 people going in. When I show up, I show up in town, and I've got a bank account that has... 87 million dollars in it and the bank president is also a Baptist Now we already know all this stuff research has been done we've studied these people in advance you've got a schedule you know you've got a schedule to follow you go in you've got a nice car you just bought the most ostentatious house in town and you tell them you're looking for a new Baptist church to start to join so he invites you to join his church so you go in and before you get there he's already let everybody know this guy drives a Lamborghini He's got $87 million. He just brought the, bought the Brewster house. You know, it's like that eyesore back, you know, wherever it is. But it's gigantic and he's got money. We should make him an official member of one of the committee. Um, Baptist churches are run on committees. So you go in and your very first day of meeting the committee, you hear the president say something, but you notice that the vice president rolls his eyes when he said it. Now, you're trained to pick up on this stuff. You're trained to know who doesn't like who. Like the majority of the time, the president is a voted in position. So most likely the president won and he appointed the vice president. The vice president was probably also winning, running for president and he lost, but he had some good ideas. So the president assigns him the vice president position, but the vice president has resentment because once you're in this position, it's for life. And the only way you can move up is he has to either move, quit, or die. You know you can't kill him, so you have to bide your time until he leaves. And that might not be for 30 or 40 years. So you're stuck playing second fiddle to this guy, wishing that he would leave. So I go out and I hang out with the president. He takes me out on his new bass boat. And he tells me, well, this guy believes this and this, but you know, and, and I think he's kind of lazy, but it's all good. So it's all good is his catchphrase. I pick up on that. And he says that a few times during that trip. It's all good. So then when I go hang out with the vice president, we hang out for a little bit and I say, hey, you know, I'm new here and I don't want to cause any trouble. There's a lie, because I do want to cause trouble. But I tell him, you know, um, I was talking to the president and he said this and this about you, but it's all good. Now, most likely what I just said is a complete lie. He didn't say that, but the vice president thinks he did because I ended it with, but it's all good. 
and the president uses that phrase all the time. So I keep talking away with all the different members and I tell all of them stuff that somebody might have really said or maybe they didn't really say it. But I always say you can't say anything to anybody because if you say something, they're going to know I said it because he told me. Now, once I have put in all the different spices and stirred the pot up really good, then I go to the Baptist preacher, I have a meeting with him and I tell him, listen, I'm new here and I don't want to cause any trouble. But this is what's going on in this committee that you put me on. You know, this person says this, this person says that. This person's doing this, this person's doing that. You know, I don't really, I'm not sure what's going on here. I don't know what I should do. The Baptist preacher thanks me for coming to him and telling him these things. And then, he's a good shepherd. He's going to have to go behind my back and ask them all if they really said these things. Well, when I tell the things that I tell him are all true. I don't lie to him. No, I tell him I don't want to start any trouble there. That's a lie. But every quote I give him is an actual quote. So when he goes behind my back and talks to all these people, they all confirm. Yeah, we said that. Yeah, I said that about this person or that person or, you know, whatever it is. They all confirm these things. So from the Baptist preacher's perspective, everyone's got a bad problem with gossiping, talking about people behind their back. The only person that seems to be telling him the truth is me. So... He goes to the president. Now, the way the devil sets this up, if the president steps down, this whole problem goes away. It's just the way it works. If the president steps down, all the infighting goes away. And so the pastor asked him, listen, you know, if you step down, everything would be fine. But this is when that guy realizes this was a popularity contest, and I won. I ain't going nowhere. And the vice president realizes, if he doesn't go anywhere, I can't move up. So in his frustration, he leaves the committee. He quits. Now, here's what the devil counts on. If the vice president leaves the committee, half the people will be on the side of the vice president, and the other half are with the president. And there's overwhelming evidence that if the vice president quits, the committee will split. And if the committee splits, the church will split. Half the people approximately stay at the church. Half the people approximately quit. Now it could be more or less of 50%, but that's pretty close. The people that leave are going to try and start their own church. If that church is not up and going in one year, it's never going to be up and going. The people that stayed are never gonna grow because on Sunday or Monday, Sunday you go to the Baptist church, Monday you're at the water cooler. Where'd you go to church yesterday? Such and such Baptist church. Oh, you don't wanna go there, they had a scandal. Well, now you have to quit because there's a scandal there. The people that left, they can't get one going because they have a scandal attached to them. So some of those people, if they get a church going, that's never gonna grow. It's gonna be that group of people and it's never going to expand from there. Some people, are going to be reabsorbed back into the community and go to other churches. Some people are going to go back to the original church, but some people are going to have a sour taste in their mouth about religion and never go back. Satan goes for the split. He doesn't want the church destroyed. He doesn't want everyone to leave. He doesn't want the building to be crumbled. He just wants a split. And that was my job. That was one of my jobs. I, it was there was an art to doing it you know if you did it right when you left you were still the good guy you know no one suspected it was you no one you know it, the baptist preacher sure doesn't suspect it was you because everything you told him was the truth we stopped attacking the baptist church in the 1990s because they accepted sexuality they accepted abortion their mini skirts you know they, they stopped wearing floor net dresses they started wearing mini skirts to church so we watered down their faith and they just, we, we stopped attacking them. Hey, if you're still here, please do me a favor and hit the like and subscribe button so this video gets recommended to other people. Thanks. Have you heard of the, that, the plant called Shanka Piedra? Nope. Know that that plant breaks kidney stone yeah. when they have never seen a kidney and they've probably never seen a kidney stone, but they call that plant a, a, a stone breaker. 
And when you ask them, I was in South America in the jungle, and I asked them, how do you know that this plant breaks kidney stones? And they say, the plant told me. Yeah, same with ayahuasca. Yeah. The sugar plant. Exactly. Yeah. They take ayahuasca, and then they speak to the plant, and the plant told them that that, ki- that breaks kidney stone. Every scientist will tell you, this is ridiculous, folks' medicine, it's worthless. Yeah. Until they did a study on 20 people, and they saw that, all the kidney stone fractures into millions of pieces and you pass them without any pain. For me, ancestral knowledge, tens of thousands of people for centuries is so much more valuable than a study. Do any other civilizations have a flood myth? More than 200 of them have flood myths, but I'll give you one example that I love. China, actually, and and some of the most ancient records that we have of China, they were a monotheistic culture that worshiped a god called Shangdi, which means the one above the emperor. And their first great emperor is called Yu the Great, and he became an emperor after he figured out how to irrigate the water that was left over uh, from a flood that had devastated China. And in that flood narrative, they believe that a couple called Fuxi and Nua built a boat, got in the boat, and sailed up to the heavens. There was a leak of water that was coming out of the heavens, flooding the earth, and Nua, what do you hear there, Noah, put together these five stones and mixed up some tar pitch and then took a brush and painted a rainbow in the sky that sealed the heavens. And so Nuwa in a boat paints a rainbow in the sky to put an end to the flood. Sound familiar? Three things. AI is not real. The thing that people call AI is not AI. And people need to shut up about it because people in the future are going to think we're stupid. Um, You can't have artificial intelligence. If it's intelligent, it can't be artificial. If it's artificial, it can't be intelligent. Um, The thing that we have is algorithmic learning. That's not artificial intelligence. That's Googling things really quickly. Computers aren't smart, they're quick. You ask a computer to write a cowboy movie script, it can only do that because it can Google other cowboy movie scripts and then just really quickly put them all together and give you something that looks like them. It couldn't make a cowboy script if no one else had done it before. AI is not going to end the world. AI is not going to save the world. AI is going to slowly die out. And then in a thousand years, if people are still around, they're going to laugh at us for believing in it like we do to people in the past. There are some missionaries, and I think it was in Ecuador, where they landed to this remote tribe and they got out on the beach and the tribe was like, oh, you people came out of a flying bird. And the people were like, yeah, nobody could talk. So it was all like hand gestures. And they were like, try on a t-shirt. And they like, it was pretty friendly. Mm-hmm. They even took the chief of the tribe up in the plane and they did a, did a round and brought him back really? down. Yeah, cra- which like, you might, that might like hurt someone's brain if they've never seen a plane mm-hmm. before. And then the, the, the missionary's like, well, hold on, hold on. We have like cotton candy and we have photos from back home. Like here's our family and the tribes take one look at it. They look at the photo and they go, wait a second. I see human faces. There's nothing behind this. And the chief goes, guys, it's black magic. Kill everybody. And the tribe fucking murders all of them right there. And so when the missionaries didn't come back, uh, like a week later, they sent out a rescue mission and there's just dead people all over the beach. And years later, like a decade later, when this tribe eventually was taught Spanish and they were sort of brought, you know, roads reached mm-hmm. them. And of course, whenever roads go into a rainforest, everybody gets domesticated. Yeah. But they were able to interview the same tribe people. No way. And they said, what were you thinking? And they said, how the hell are we supposed to know? They said, you showed us a picture. So we never saw a picture before. They said, yeah, they were flying around in a metal thing and showing us pictures. They said, we just assumed that they were devils. So we killed them just to be safe. They said, we were a little spooked. That's fucking insane. And it was like a totally like natural move for them. They were just like, you know, these, these people seem a little too friendly. All right. I hope you enjoyed our session. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already. Thanks again for showing up, and I'll see you around.